will get inflation back to target. There's no question about that. We are entering anyway a situation of uh, uh, more, more stability after what has been a, a, a strong shock on, on, on in the interest rates. The trend is down, which suggests that uh, we are past peak inflation. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Francine Lacroix. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Here's what's coming up on today's program. Bailey's warning after the biggest rate hike in 27 years, the Bank of England governor tells the UK to brace for contraction amid unrelenting inflation. Jobs in focus. While the U.S. labor market may be cooling, today's payrolls report is expected to show hiring holding up. Plus, with a whimper or with a bang, as earnings season winds down, we'll break down the top trends and key takeaways. Well, we'll have, of course, more on the Bank of England's rate decision. I'm really excited about this interview. It's an exclusive interview with the central bank's chief economist, Hugh Pill. It's about 9.45 a.m. London time. Now, terminal users can just go into IB plus TV Go. You can send questions you'd like answered from Hugh Pill. It is pretty punchy if you think about it. Forecasting a five-quarter recession, this is what we heard from the Bank of England, whilst at the same time uh, putting up rates 50 basis points. So he'll help us understand exactly the thinking and maybe some of the pitfalls, what it means for the markets and also QT. Now, let's check on the markets uh, overall. After the week that was, and I keep on forgetting that it was only three days ago that Nancy Pelosi was in Taiwan. It feels like we've had so much news over the last weekdays that it's kind of a little bit of a blur. So TGIF is what a lot of people are saying in the markets. We do have the U.S. report on jobs today. Uh, that could, again, give us an indication of what the Fed does. But we're seeing, finally, a bit of stability on the markets. S&P futures up a touch. European stocks also. And then the pound is a big one that we're watching out for. I did ask the Bank of England governor yesterday whether a weak pound uh, is tricky going forward. He says, look, we're not seeing a sterling crisis at all, 121.50. Now, the only bit of pressure that we're seeing, if you look at the European map, so we look at the difference, for example, between the DAX, uh, the CAC 40, but also the FTSE, is that the FTSE is one of the indices that, just like the CAC 40, is pretty much unchanged. I think it was down two tenths of 8% a little bit earlier on. Again, not huge, but this is probably a sterling story, and this is probably also an energy story with the biggest sectors down energy very uh, weighted forward for example for BP one of the biggest movers in today's trading session now US jobs growth expected to have slowed in July according to economists surveyed by Bloomberg that's as labor demand cools amid tighter monetary policy now back in Europe it's been a busy earnings season where a recession loomed large on the minds of the continent's business leaders Inflation. inflation 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 gets worse we have the steepest challenge in cost inflation inflation is going to stay we certainly see peak inflation coming sometime in the second half we have some double digit inflationary costs simple reality is we're seeing inflation everywhere maybe the economy will stagnate but it might also fall into a recession we do see a, a softening of, of economic conditions in the second half of the year and potentially a recession uh, at least at this point a modest recession we are of course watching central banks uh, reaction to that inflation it's a mix of inflations and uh, and the labor market circumstances if inflation continues to be here of course it will be reflected also in pay turbulent times as uh, as you've been saying all morning absolutely now to talk about the markets we're joined by Anita Tana head of EMEA equity sales at Barclays Anita thank you for joining us inflation I mean if you look at the Bank of England forecast if you're looking at some of the main concerns I mean it's been a, a, a pretty unsettling week overall yeah, it absolutely has. Um, as you quite rightly highlight, um, Bailey was very negative in terms of the outlook for the UK in particular, um, talking about record high inflation, so 13% um, in Q4. And obviously that plays into the rates and inflation narrative that has been governing markets all year. But so what are we expecting from the Bank of England exactly? I mean, I, I know the market barely moved because they were expecting this 50 basis point increase. But if you think about it, I mean, they're hiking 50 basis points, which they probably have no choice, into five quarters of recession. And we have no idea what the fiscal plan looks like, depending on who becomes prime minister. Absolutely. So it, they are, like many central banks, stuck between a rock and a hard place. Of course, if they front load on the hikes, 
get in front of inflation, um, then the recessionary fears come up. And if they do the opposite, then the inflation fears come up and they're perceived to be behind the curve. So it is a very tricky tightrope um, for, of course, the Bank of England, but of course, for all central banks globally. Yeah, and they're being praised, actually, by a couple of economists, including Mohamed Elari, and saying, well, at least they're honest. Should the Fed do the same or do, could it spell mayhem on the market? So you, we're looking at, for example, that jobs report later. Of course. So as you say, um, the jobs report is quite key, as is all the data points, because the Fed have said that they're data dependent going forwards. Now, I think the key to bring out here is that bad news is good news for markets at the moment, in that the rally that we've seen in the last six weeks has really been around the idea that the Fed could be pivoting from the aggressive rates and inflation narrative that we've seen governing markets for a lot of this year um, to a softer stance. And I think that's what's driven markets markets in the last six weeks in particular um, and that's why these data points coming up are so crucial yeah. if of course they're weaker than expected it could drive markets that much higher um, and the same is true of the opposite so what does it mean for Europe that we're kind of like at the confluence of all this bad news yeah, you're absolutely right. So when we think about Europe in the global context, we, Barclays, are that much more negative on Europe. And part of the reason is for that is the proximity to the gas situation. That means that the consumer is in a tougher position. That means corporates are in a tougher position. And it's why we're that much more negative with regards to recessionary fears for Europe versus the rest of the world. Because when we think about recession away from the technical recession that we've seen yeah. in the US, for example, when we think about it in terms of a breakdown in the yeah. consumer, or very, very tough but, unemployment trends, that really plays into Europe worse than it does the rest of the world. So what does it mean for equities? Because you see, so I was surprised. We had this amazing story, which was one of our most read, that's saying, you know, I always thought Germany would pay the brunt because of the energy price, because of the proximity to Russia. But they were saying, you know, France could be one of the worst off because of also some of the nuclear reactors that are not working. Do you go regionally or country by country? Or because the exposure is so much more global, it's a, more on a group basis? It's sort of broad-based, isn't it? I think the point that you're bringing out is it could be Germany, it could be France, it could be broader-based within Europe because everything has a play-through. Um, so it's very difficult to pick out which one in particular, but I think that it's true to say that because of Europe's proximity to the situation and because it's very, very difficult um, to diversify sources going into the winter, but also structurally and over the medium term, there is no easy solution. Um, I think we have a chart. I think my producer just said that we, we need to talk a little bit about the world food prices. Are we underestimating the impact that this could have on, on Europe at this point, Anita? So actually what we've seen in the last few weeks or so is some relief around um, commodity prices and um, input costs in general um, and that has been part of the driver towards the upside for markets um, in the last six weeks or so it's why short term things are playing out very very differently than what investors thought so there's, there's the short term at the moment the relief around the fed pol uh, policy pivot um, also some of the disinflation trends that you're seeing ever so slightly coming through on that chart um, and then there's the medium term outlook which is very much more geared to the aggressive rates and inflation narrative we Barclays believe that people are a little bit too bullish on the idea that the Fed will of course pivot their policy away from what we've seen much of this year so, so that means bargain hunting maybe <laughs> could you find where do you find the what's do you have a conviction trade um, so the way we are viewing things at the moment is very much barbelled. Um, so we're being very, very cognizant of the fact that in the short term there's relief in markets. Um, and so we do have some bullish cyclical exposures that we're recommending. But then we're also saying... To, to have defensive exposures in mind as well um, because the medium term outlook is that much more tricky. So at this juncture, we completely appreciate that things are less clear in the medium term with that much more negative and defensively positioned. Um, Anita, I mean, our question of the week, and I know you cover you know, more equities, but in general, where's the biggest risk in the credit market right now? Is it something that, you know, that, that we need to get right or actually the, the rest of the strategies could go wrong? So the credit market is a really, really interesting point, um, and our credit strategists are actually quite negative on markets overall. Um, they are recommending to be defensively positioned, um, and they're quite concerned about cyclical exposures and the broader read-through from the economic trends that we're seeing. Anita, thank you so much, as always, for joining us. Anita thank Tana, their head of EMEA equity sales at Barclays. Now, coming up, after unleashing the biggest rate hike in 27 years, the Bank of England governor warns the UK to brace for an economic contraction amid unrelenting inflation. That story is up next, and this is Bloomberg.
economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, the Bank of England says the UK faces a protracted recession after it raised interest rates by 50 basis points to 1.75%, the biggest increase in 27 years. Here's the Bank of England Governor, Andrew Bailey. We will get inflation back to target. There's no question about that. Uh, so that's my message to, to people in the street. Now, of course, it's very hard. I mean, it's very hard, particularly for those on low incomes in this country who are much more affected by inflation, which is concentrated, as it is, in energy particularly. But if we don't get it under control, it will get worse, and we will have to raise interest rates by more. And let's get straight to our Lizzie Birding for more analysis. Lizzie, I mean, it, it is crazy to think that they're basically expecting a five-quarter recession and they're hiking 50 basis points. I mean, do they feel powerless? I'm sure they must, but they've had to make a decision and they've chosen to prioritise controlling inflation, no ifs, no buts, yeah. uh, and because they see it rising not just into double digits, but above 13%. Uh, you know, it's a difficult choice to make. The, the forecasts are gloomy, but you'd hope that they're gloomier than the reality is going to be because, of course, they can't take account of what's going to happen in fiscal policy and we're about to get a new prime minister. Though you could argue that perhaps this is going to become some sort of self-fulfilling prophecy because it's so bleak. Frankly, I've woken up depressed this morning. I'm sure you feel it too. It's on the front page of every UK national newspaper this morning. And I think you can really feel the absence of Boris Johnson. Usually you'd have his boosterish filter on this economic news, but he's on holiday, so's the Chancellor. And all we've got is this grim outlook from the grey officials at the BOE. Yeah, and you, you have to wonder how that plays into, of course, you know, people asking for raises and companies and things like that. Okay, QT, we were hoping or expecting, the market was expecting to have have more than that line on QT and we didn't really get it. Yeah, you tried. Bank I tried. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew Bailey's been on uh, broadcast this morning saying that it's not going to affect markets, that they're doing all of this asset selling. Uh, but really, this is something the Bank of England has never done, nor has any other mm -hmm. central bank. We found out yesterday that there's going to be £80 billion of QT in the first year, £10 billion a quarter. And the emphasis was that uh, interest rates remain the active tool. That's why they didn't want to tell you how much it's worth in terms of basis points of rate hikes. But really, it does seem hard to imagine markets can ignore this. Yeah, 100%. And then we'll, we're also speaking to the chief economist, of course, Hugh Pill, and we'll try and figure out, for example, what it will take for them not to go ahead with the QT, right? I don't know if there's another meltdown or something like that. Lizzie, thank you so much. As always, great reporting. Our Lizzie Burden there. Now, don't miss um, our interview, our exclusive interview with the Bank of England's chief economist, Hugh Pill. That's at 9.40 a.m. UK time. So in about 30 minutes from now, you can send questions through IB plus TV Go, or you can message me directly on Twitter. Now, to talk about the UK, we're joined by Bruno Skarica, UK economist at Morgan Stanley. Bruna, thank you for joining us. I mean, it is pretty crazy right. to, to, to see the forecast being so gloomy from the Bank of England. Are they predicting the worst because they also don't know who will be prime minister? Of course. Well, the Bank of England works with a certain set of assumptions. Uh, the first one, of course, is fiscal policy as it is announced. So moving forward, they're not assuming any further fiscal support. The second assumption uh, is bank rate, of course, as implied by the markets. So there is an element here of if you're expecting further fiscal support, as indeed I believe everyone is given the announcements in the leadership campaign, the actual outturn next year could be a bit better than what the Bank of England uh, projected. But their hands are tied. They're working with fiscal policy as assumed as announced. Uh, Bruno, I spoke to the Bank of England governor yesterday, and I really tried to, to, mm. to push him. I know they don't talk about the pound, but I really tried to, to understand, you know, mm. th this has a, you know, a huge impact on what they're trying to do. Are we in a pound crisis? No, I believe that's not the case. Look, um, the Bank of England outlined uh, their, their kind of thinking on sterling um, in some, I would say, detail yesterday in the minutes. They basically said, look, uh, trade-weighted sterling uh, is down uh, compared to the May uh, MPC meeting. However, about 60% of that move is relative to the dollar. So uh, I do think that there is an element here of that dollar move that they can't necessarily impact. But um, in terms of why they take the currency into account, of course, Governor Bailey says that often a lot of our 
inflation overshoot is imported via energy and food prices. About 80% of that overshoot yeah. is imported. And so, of course, uh, the currency here matters and it's an almost instantaneous way of impacting financial conditions. How much, Bruna, should we worry really about unemployment in this country? Of course. Well, look, the Bank of England assumes that the unemployment rate will start rising in the first quarter of 2023. Um, I think the first indicator they'll be looking at in the run-up to their September and November meeting um, are vacancies, actually. Uh, they talked a lot yesterday at the press conference and in the NPR about how elevated that ratio of vacancy per unemployment is. And I think if they see vacancies falling down as demand growth slows, perhaps they could move back to a lower gear of tightening to 25 basis points as opposed to 50. In terms of whether the unemployment rate will rise, well, if we do get some supply back, and of course the economy is slowing down, then we could see an increase. But here at Morgan Stanley, we are a bit more constructive than the bank is at the moment. Um, Bruna, do you think, and this is something that we'll try and get also from Hugh Pill and, you know, the, or, or the, mm. the governor when we get to speak to them, longer term, are interest rates in the mm. UK going to be higher or lower than what the ECB will set and what the Fed will set? Look, the UK is in the middle of, uh, you know, geographically and in terms of monetary policy of the US and the euro area. We have a very tight labor market. So in that sense, we're similar to the US. But of course, we're exposed to the same energy shock as Europe is. Of course, we don't get our gas supply from Russia anymore, but we are exposed to European gas prices. And so um, being uh, in between means that, you know, our energy price increases means lower growth. That's exactly what the Bank of England is forecasting. But a tight labor market means higher wage growth than what we've seen in Europe. And that, of course, means tighter monetary policy. So here at Morgan Stanley, that's exactly what we think will happen yeah. moving forward. We have the Fed funds rate higher uh, than uh, the, the BOE uh, bank rate, uh, and indeed the bank yeah. rate higher than uh, the depot rate in, in the euro area. So, uh, Bruna, give me a sense of, I know we're, you know, it's more politics, but we have a leadership race. So depending on who becomes prime minister, <clears throat> will the UK outlook significantly change economically? Look, um, I can give you our growth forecasts for next year, which are basically flat. Uh, the Bank of England is working with a 1.5% contraction on the year. Um, I think the first step to think about is, of course, uh, the energy price increase in the fourth quarter. Um, the energy cap, the utility bills cap, uh, will increase by far more than, for example, what former Chancellor Sunak expected would be the case when he gave that fiscal statement in late May. On our calculation, um, if the Treasury wants to to cover the same relative proportion of that utility bills increase as was the case yeah. in, in late May, they would have to provide about 14 billion pounds of extra spending for utility bills alone. Yeah. Um, of course, one of the leadership contenders is talking about tax cuts as well. Um, we do think that some which of the tax cuts that are mentioned, yeah. Um, yeah. which, which are mentioned, I, I do think have lower multiplier on, on growth than, for example, infrastructure investment and things yeah. like that. But they will help with, with boosting growth through 2023, we think. So in that sense, we're a bit more constructive on growth, assuming further, further fiscal easing than the Bank of England is. Bruna, thank you so much. Bruna Skarica, their UK economist at Morgan Stanley, joining us, of course, on the back of that Bank of England decision. Now, we have a headline like we've rarely seen. This is from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of China. China has just announced sanctions on U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. Now, this is, of course, three days after she visited Taiwan. Unclear what these sanctions are. Is it personal sanctions? Is it on bank accounts? Or is it just more of a symbolic sanctions that she can't go into China? And how problematic would that be? going forward. So we'll dig deeper to try and understand exactly what these sanctions could look like. Coming up, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken accuses China of seeking to change the status quo in the Taiwan Strait. So we'll have plenty more on that geopolitical tension with those sanctions being announced on U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. This is Bloomberg.
economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now let's get straight to the Bloomberg First Word News. Here's Leanne Gerens. Hi, Leanne. Hi, Francine. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken says China has chosen to overreact to Nancy Pelosi's visit to Taiwan. This comes after Japan said China likely filed missiles over Taiwan during yesterday's military drills. If confirmed, it would be a major escalation as China have never flown missiles over the island itself before. Tokyo estimated that five ballistic missiles landed in Japan's exclusive economic zone and four probably flew over the island. China has chosen to overreact and use Speaker Pelosi's visit as a pretext to increase provocative military activity in and around the Taiwan Strait. Now, U.S. health officials have declared monkeypox a public health emergency, a step aimed at raising access to more funding to fight the virus. Monkeypox has spread to more than 26,000 people globally in just a few months, leading the WHO to declare the outbreak a public health emergency of international concern last month. And South Korea has launched its first home-developed lunar orbiter, becoming the seventh country to join the already competitive race to spend spacecraft into the moon. The craft lifted off from Cape Canaveral in Florida just after 7 p.m. local time and successfully separated from Falcon 9. Francine. Leanne, thank you so much. We'll have plenty more, of course, on the markets too. This is Bloomberg. Bailey's warning after the biggest rate hike in 27 years, the Bank of England governor tells the UK to brace for a contraction amid unrelenting inflation. Jobs in focus while the U.S. labor market may be cooling. Today's payrolls report is expected to show hiring holding up. Plus, with a whimper or with a bang as earnings season winds down, we'll break down the top trends and key takeaways. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. So Nancy Pelosi's visit to Taiwan has sparked a retaliation. The U.S. House Speaker remains undeterred, saying China cannot stop U.S. officials from visiting the island. Well, China's foreign ministry has responded with sanctions on Pelosi herself. Taiwan, meanwhile, says Beijing sent warships across Taiwan Strait, dividing line today, an unusual move signaling its largest drills in decades around the islands were continuing for a second day. Well, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken called the move an overreaction. Let's bring in Cindy Wang, who joins us from Taipei. So, Cindy, it's been quite a week. What's the latest update? Yeah, exactly. That's a quite a week. So the latest update we have today is that China, um, according to Taiwanese Defense Ministry, that China sent groups of war plants and warships crossing the straight median line as of 11 a.m. local time. So for the war plans, we have seen that that's the third day in a row this week that um, China's war plans are flying across the straight median line for the third day. On Wednesday and Thursday, China has sent 22 war plans, respectively, crossing the straight median line. So this is the third day in a row. But for the warship part, it's more interesting because this is the first time in many years that Taiwan's defense ministry officially confirms that China sent war warships crossing the straight median line. So in response to that, yeah. uh, Taiwan side, they issued the radio warnings. They deployed the uh, air patrol and naval ship to monitor the situations. And it's yeah. very likely that for the next 48 hours before China finishes its uh, military drills, we're going to see more prov provocative actions here. Yeah, and Sonia, I was going to ask, I mean, you have a read on this more than probably anyone else. These are, you know, provocations. Was it pretty much how we were expecting it to, you know, to pan out, or is this a real escalation? Well, I think that's a question many people here are also debating and trying to figure out. I think um, this, of course, is China's provocative action that's in response to um, U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's historic visit to Taipei. So China just want to signal that, well, the Taiwan, uh, they want to stress that uh, their territorial integrity and sovereignty. So they think it's, it's not, not right for U.S. House Speaker to visit Taipei. So that's a way to no. show their displeasure. 
But on the other hand, I think this historical visit to Taipei has really has a very significant meaning for people in Taiwan here because that just hugely boosts the visibility of Taiwan in the international community yeah. and again, just highlight Taiwan's status as a bastion for democracy and freedom. Um, uh, Cindy, I think about 15 minutes ago, we had news from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of China that they were going to impose uh, sanctions on Nancy Pelosi. Do we have any idea of what they look like? I mean, it, is it her and, and family members not being able to do business with China and Hong Kong or even entering it? Yeah, so far we've just know that China announced the sanction on Nancy Pelosi as well as her family. Uh, we are waiting to see for more details, but I think the sanction move is probably expected by many people watching for this development because um, before Pelosi's visit to Taipei, China has already warned the U.S. of great consequences if Pelosi does visit Taiwan. And so far we have seen China really has very strong reactions in terms of military actions. They are sending war plans, warships crossing the straight median line. They are also having yeah. this uh, economic retaliation targeting Taiwan, like banning the food imports from Taiwan's uh, producers as well as um, sandbank yeah exports to Taiwan and also we also see that many Taiwanese government websites suffering yeah. from many times cyber attack these days so China is really like um, launching the various strong actions toward Taiwan and toward yeah. Pelosi's visit and we're watching very closely for any more any more uh, reactions from China in the following yeah. days. Yeah, it definitely feels, Cindy, like things are being ratcheted up. Thank you so much, Cindy Wang, there, joining us from Taipei. Now, this is what the markets are telling us. Now, U.S. equity futures holding uh, to some of the gains that we saw earlier. European stocks also holding to those. Uh, technology shares are actually advancing. Investors bracing for the monthly U.S. jobs report that are likely to enliven the recession debate. So European stocks actually a bit of a reversal, done two-tenths of a percent. There were earlier gains some three-tenths of a percent. Investors flocking back to defensive shares. Coming up. Tesla has cleared the way for a three-to-one stock split. More from its annual shareholders meeting next. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance or the edition of Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, Tesla's AGM took place last night at the company's Gigafactor in Austin, Texas. As expected, the electric vehicle maker approved a stock split, and Elon Musk's QA did definitely not disappoint. Never boring. Joining us now is Bloomberg's Laura Wright. Laura, what did we get? What is the significance, actually, of the stock split and, and the, the AGM in general? Well, the stock split three for one. It's significant because it democratizes Tesla's share price, making it cheaper for Tesla's highly engaged retail investor base. It will bring the share price down to around $300 a share from over $900 a share where it closed yesterday. Worth noting, the last stock split at Tesla took place in August of 2020. Elon Musk outlined his view that inflation will subside over the coming months. You might call that a contrary call in the current environment and provided a bullish update that Tesla could deliver one and a half million vehicles by the end of 2022 if achieved that follows a record first quarter of deliveries and there was a hint Francine at a new factory yeah we might be able to announce another factory location later this year uh, <laughs> where, where should we okay where, where should we build it Okay, we've got a lot, got a lot of Canada's. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I'm, half, I'm half Canadian, so maybe I should, you know. Francino might add, Matt Miller is absolutely delighted that the Cybertruck is on track to come online in mid-2023. I find the vehicle's angular design so flair. Yeah, I quite like it, but then I liked Back to the Future with that really iconic car. Okay, the elephant in the room, Twitter, I love following this because this is, Eli this is like pure and simple Elon Musk, right? He engages with the room and he engages with this fight on Twitter. 
Exactly, and it came up in the Q&A where Musk admitted that the only publicly traded companies that he owns are Tesla and Twitter. But this is an ugly legal battle with subpoenas and countersues flying around. Although Musk admitted that he genuinely wanted to help the social media platform and he understands the company. All right, we need a picture, actually, of the car, the Tesla car. We're going to get it to you, Laura. We're going to put it on social media and then do a little bit of a poll on who likes and who doesn't. Yes. Laura, right there with the very latest on some of these tech companies. Coming up, the Bank of England warns the UK to brace for recession after the biggest rate hike in 27 years. Don't miss our exclusive interview with the central bank's chief economist, Hugh Pill. That's coming up next, and this is Bloomberg. get inflation back to target. There's no question about that. Uh, so that's my message to, to people in the street. Now, of course, it's very hard. I mean, it's very hard, particularly for those on low incomes in this country who are much more affected by inflation, which is concentrated as it is in energy particularly. But if we don't get it under control, it will get worse and we will have to raise interest rates by more. Well, that was the Bank of England Governor Andrew Bailey on inflation and the prospects of a UK recession. Welcome to our TV viewers and radio listeners on Bloomberg. We're delighted now to be joined for an exclusive conversation by Hugh Pill, Chief Economist at the Bank of England, really the man of the hour. So many questions, Hugh. First of all, thank you so much for making the time to come on Bloomberg. But so many questions on whether this time around we can really trust your forecast. What are your models? Are your models broken? Well, I think you have to see our forecasts against the background of the the news we're facing and the magnitude of, of changes in developments in the economy. Um, so as I think was emphasized by uh, my colleagues who spoke yesterday, even since May, we've seen a doubling of the sort of relevant measures of wholesale gas prices in Europe. And we know that those are the key elements that feed through yes. into energy utility bills that households in the UK are going to face. And, you know, we've made the calculations on the back of the announcement that was made yesterday morning by Ofgem. And that suggests, as we've reported in our publications yesterday, that, um, you know, the, the cap will rise to three and a half thousand yeah. pounds. I mean, it's only six months ago, it was less than two thousand pounds. Yeah. So I think we have to understand that the scale of the shocks affecting the UK economy, particularly affecting the households in the economy, are really very large. And our forecasts have to change to reflect that. When we're taking policy decisions, we're not prisoners of any single forecast. Yeah. And I think one of the but things that was emphasized yesterday by the governor is we've done a range of analysis with different assumptions about energy prices, different assumptions about interest rates and so forth. And across that set of analysis, there are certain key messages that come out. Yeah. First key message, I think is that across that range, we will see a recession. The recession is the consequence of energy price rises we've seen in the past. Well, five quarters of a downturn, right? Yeah. It's more than a recession. It's like a protracted downturn. Right, and I think that's a reflection of the magnitude of this increase coming from energy prices into household incomes yeah. here in the UK. And the second thing is we will see in inflation go up because the other side of this increase in but energy here. prices is the increase in inflation. And then the third element is, and this is what the governor was just referring to, is in all our, our analysis, partly due to our own uh, efforts, but also uh, on the assumption that exchange uh, sorry, uh, energy prices will eventually stabilize, we do see inflation coming back right. towards target towards the end but of our But is this worst case scenario, so a gas embargo, and is it also with, with possible you know, fiscal expenditure from Liz Truss, who becomes, she becomes prime minister? How difficult is it to know what the prime minister does, the next one? Well, I mean, I think there are two things this year. On the energy prices, our baseline scenario is just based on the assumption that we follow futures. We can see those Fine. on your screens for the next six months, and then we lock that in. That is a locking in gas prices, oil prices, at historically high levels, which persist indefinitely. Yeah. And for the UK, which is an importer of energy, that implies that there is this prolonged squeeze on real incomes, which yeah. is a big feature of our forecast. Regarding the fiscal side, of course, I mean, we're in a slightly... Um, complicated, shall we say, political situation. I'm not going to comment on that, as others have not either. But it changes everything. But, but I think a key thing is we are making an assumption in our forecast on announced government policies, the most recent of which is the, 
the May uh, uh, adjustments that we've seen for uh, um, addressing the gas. But crucially, and I think this is important, is, I'll repeat the same thing again, we are not prisoners of the baseline published forecast yesterday. And in thinking our policy, we are, of course, taking into account risks to all these conditional yeah. assumptions, including the fiscal. But you, inflation also feels much more embedded, mm -hmm. right? So, so at, at what point is it to a point of where there's a, a spiral and it's, much, it's almost impossible to keep control of it? Right. So I think your point about embedding, that is a key point. So when you say it feels much more embedded, the reason why inflation is going to 13% in our forecast is not really a, of itself an embedding story. It's a story coming from energy yep. prices. The direct, the direct effect of energy prices on inflation uh, over the next year at the peak amount to about six and a half percentage points. The indirect effects, the fact that energy price rises, I mean, it's more expensive to light the studio and so forth, so feeds through into service. Yeah. We think that's about another third. Right. So around eight to nine percentage points of reaching 13 percent are coming really from this rise in energy prices. You're right, though, that what matters for us, what we can do something about, as we've emphasized in our statements in, of late, is that com persistent component of overall inflation that part of inflation that is still there into two, three years' time that is still able to be responded to by policy decisions we take today, yes. given the lags that it takes for our policy decisions to w taken today to work their way through to price development. We did a bit of research. You know what's the most Googled question mm. on Google for the UK economy today is, do I buy a house price right now? Buying a house during a recession, should I be buying a house right now? What, what impact does this have, given mortgages are going up, given it's, I think, a £1,000 more expensive for house buyers paying that mortgage on average? What does it mean for the housing market? Well, housing market, first of all, I, I wouldn't overemphasize from the point of view of our assessment of the economy. I mean, the housing market is important, but it's not something we would give a status to beyond yeah. any other important elements. I mean, of course, fundamentally, what we are trying to do with our interest rate increases is to slow the momentum in the economy in order to contain inflation. I mean, that's what the agenda for monetary policy is right now, given inflation is so high and potential persistence there. Part of that will be operating through and via the housing market. I mean, you mentioned the point that um, uh, mortgage payments will go up. I mean, what I'd again emphasize is what you say is true. That is part of a process yeah. that is slowing down, the mar uh, slowing down the housing market, slowing down the economy. But it's also true that that is smaller than the impact of this rise in energy prices, right? right? So I think we can right. distract ourselves from the big story if we begin to let... The way I would see it is, the way I'd emphasize is, we've seen this big shock to energy prices that has pushed up inflation, squeezed incomes. There is an interest rate response to that to constrain inflation, and that is partly working through the housing markets, which we would expect to cool. My colleagues on the financial stability part of the bank, of course, do their own analysis, and at the moment, at least, they think there's some resilience there. We're not expecting to see the sort of dramatic downturn that we've seen in the past. Given what you've just beautifully explained, how likely is it that we get another 50 basis point hike in September? Well, we're going to take decisions, as we always do, but I'd emphasize one step at a time, one meeting at a time. So I don't think you can read in to subsequent meetings the fact we made a 50 basis point change, and I'd, I'd caution against that. I think a careful reading of our statement yesterday would be consistent with the view that, as I think I said last time I was here, yes. we're trying to ensure there's an element of flexibility <laughs> yes. in the framework for two reasons. One, there is a diversity of views across members of the committee, which needs yes. to be encompassed. And for any individual on the committee, at least in myself, given the uncertainties we the face, I think we need flexibility either to go further yeah. or to stay where we are and the pace at which we go further to be varied according to circumstances. Do you feel like you're behind the curve? I mean, I, I know that the, the a lot of the UK press are going after the bank. Yeah. I mean, I don't think we're behind the curve. I, th I think a key element here is when you think about the persistent element of inflation that we're focused on, that's an element which by its nature is a slow-moving element. If you think about the impact of monetary policy, because of the lags that are in the, the system that right. I just mentioned, the impact of monetary policy on the economy is a slow-moving phenomenon. So what we're trying to do here is match those slower-moving developments in persistent inflation with an appropriate impact of monetary policy. And I don't think that is something that is about one month here or there. That's about something that's going to last over a period okay. of years. But how can the bank be forward-looking if you know, inflation and employment are basically lagging? So you see them too late. Yeah. Well, we can be forward-looking because we make forecasts. I mean, as I said, and as the governor said yesterday, those forecasts are difficult now, yep. given the uncertainties yep. we face. 
how can we make our decisions more robust in the face of those forecasts? Well, we look at a variety of different analyses. We look at a variety of different scenarios. We published many of those yesterday. And crucially, I think what we're trying to do is always extract from this broad set of information yeah. we, uh, we see that component which informs us about this persistent element of inflation that's still yes. going to be there in two or three years time. Hugh, the bank did also get some praise in saying like look you were the first ones you were honest you're, you're you know painting this very complicated picture with this pretty horrific uh, recession. W longer term do you think interest rates in the UK will be higher than in the US and the ECB? Well I think I mean what's key for us is that we get inflation to target if we get inflation to target, then interest rates will be, we hope, broadly speaking, at some slightly positive premium to that level of inflation, reflecting real returns in the economy. So, you know, the real rate of interest is uh, the nominal rate of interest that we're setting, take away inflation. That gap should be positive. It sh it, it, we were not expecting uh, a repeat of experiences of the past, of my childhood, where interest rates were going sky high. Uh, we think that the, the, sort of the equilibrium level of interest rate, if you like, that's a very vague concept, a difficult to estimate, but we think it's much lower now than it was in yeah. previous episodes. So around what level? Well, I, I mean, I'm always cautious. You've asked me I that know, before, too. I'm always cautious because I think it's a very uncertain level. In nominal terms, right, so just to emphasize, if we, as we're intending to do and I expect us to do, and people should have confidence in, in us doing, if we get inflation back to target of 2%, the nominal interest rates will return to levels, broadly speaking, in that kind of range as well. Okay. Do you see them? Do you see interest rates peaking around three percent? Well, I know that's what markets are currently pricing. Yes. I don't. Again, I don't want to be uh, pinned down. We will do with policy and with interest rates as our actual instrument what we need to do in the in the light of events in the face of circumstances on this meeting to make meeting basis that I've described in order to achieve our target I know you don't want to be pinned down but they're, they're, are they broadly are they off or are, or are they pretty much in that range are, what are markets getting wrong I'm not sure markets are getting too much wrong um, I mean personally I think we are in a process of transition from a long prolonged period basically since the onset of the global financial crisis, that's almost 15 years ago now, from, uh, from where monetary policy has been very easy, monetary policy has had interest rates close to their lower bound, we've been doing QE. We're clearly extracting ourselves from that period, which lasted for a very long time, um, as the world changes. That process of extraction requires a certain element of caution because there's a danger having gone, in a way, from one extreme with monetary policy. I think we have to guard against, like, falling into the trap of going to the opposite extreme and you know we're in a process of trying to calibrate interest rates calibrate our policy stance to achieve our goal in a challenging environment but in an environment with our risks on both sides there's a risk of doing too much and exacerbating a recession and prolonging a recession which we think is already going to be there there's also of course a risk of doing too little uh, and allowing inflation to become embedded so we don't want to oversteer what's, we don't want to understeer. what's the less mistake I know there's like a Goldilocks but Right, well, of course, I mean, in assessing whether we're oversteering or understeering, we are thinking about those risks. Yeah. At the moment, I mean, our policy decision reflects the fact that this fear of embeddedness yeah. is one that we have to respond to more. Hugh, I, I could speak to you for like an hour. Mm -hmm. I only have one minute on QT. How should we look at QT? So, first of all, it, is it really that difficult to give the correlation between basis point in you know, terms and how much QT impact will have? Right, so I think there are two questions there. First question is, is it easy to give you a number whatever yep. X best base points. I think that is a very difficult question. Yep. And it's a difficult question because as we have published in our own document a few uh, um, months ago, I can see, I can hear the music, so you want me to stop. <laughs> the short answer is, I think QT will probably have a tightening effect. Yeah. It'll come through asset prices. We will see those asset prices. We will set interest rates incorporating those impact of those asset prices in order to get inflation back to target. Hugh, one hour next time. You and I, because we have a lot to talk about. Thank you okay. so much for your Thank time you. today. The chief economist there of the Bank of England, Hugh Pill. We'll have plenty more throughout the day. Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition continues. interesting economy at the moment with this very tight labor market. We've hit a little bit of a floor in terms of growth. We're going through a period where the economy appears to be weakening further. We may or may not be in a recession. Come on. We're going to go into recession. Major economies are going to go into recession. The Fed is 
hiking pretty aggressively into an economy that's very clearly slowing down. Um, I don't I don't know how that ends well. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Anna Edwards, Matt Miller and Kaylee Lines. It's 10 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York and 5 p.m. in Hong Kong. Our top stories today. What the U.S. jobs report will tell us about recession. The latest unemployment numbers out today may show the labor market is cooling down. China strikes back at Pelosi. It plans to impose sanctions on the House Speaker for that visit to Taiwan. Meanwhile, Democrats have agreed on a revised tax bill that would impose a levy on stock buybacks. And the world's richest person sees signs that the global economy has gone past peak inflation. Tesla CEO Elon Musk says the car makers' costs are trending downwards. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller and Kaylee Lines over in New York. And Kaylee, a lot to discuss today when it comes to the payroll picture in the U.S. But before that, equities, risk assets seem to be losing their cool just a little bit. A little bit, but it depends where in the world you look, Anna. Of course, everyone is equally awaiting that jobs report in about three and a half hours' time. But in Asia overnight, the trading week ended before we get that data, and actually it largely was quite positive. The MSCI Asia Pacific Index as a whole was up about nine-tenths of one percent. What's interesting is that Taiwan was outperforming. The Taiwan benchmark up two and a quarter percent, even as we have an escalation in Chinese military drills around the island. We'll have more on that story in just a moment, but interesting to see risk sentiment doing okay there. Now, the other story related to China continues to be the turmoil in the property sector, demand for certain commodities like iron ore, but we have reports of about 10 steel makers in China restarting operations. More are expected next week. So that lifting iron ore futures by about 3.8% in Singapore, trading just under $110 a barrel. But of course, that was snapping a five-day losing streak, and still those prices are down on the week. Finally, in foreign exchange, the big outperformer in Asia is the Thai bot, stronger against the dollar by about nine-tenths of 1%. That is after inflation hit a 14-year high so that is ramping up bets that we may actually get a hike out of the bank of thailand next week matt all right so more hikes from central banks and we still see real strength uh, in the asian session in terms of the u.s futures we're looking at not a lot of action and frankly when you have such a big release you do see a lot of traders sitting on their hands and humans actually turning off the computers until the numbers come out so that they can actually make decisions themselves instead of having the algorithms do everything as usual bloomberg u.s dollar index right now a little change but a little bit stronger so maybe um, some people are seeking safety in in assets like the dollar, in assets like the 10-year bond, you can see the yield coming down just a bit, um, not even one full basis point, but 268.27 is a fairly low level that we're looking at right now that it, uh, shows investors have really piled into the bond market, telling a different sign than uh, the equities markets um, over the last month that the bond traders are, or bond uh, investors are waiting for a recession while equity investors think that maybe um, the Fed's gonna turn around. Bitcoin, by the way, um, is up pretty strong right now. 3%, of course, this is from five o'clock yesterday, but over $23,000 right now, and it's a very correlated asset. So maybe this is some sign that we'll see more forward movement in terms of equities later uh, when we get the open. Anna, what do you see in terms of Europe? Yeah, that Bitcoin move is interesting, isn't it? Uh, going uh, that much higher, Matt. This is the European picture. And just up until about now, uh, half an hour ago, we seem to be kind of sitting on our hands here in Europe as well, waiting for that job sprint out of the US. But things have deteriorated just in the last half hour or so. We're still waiting for the data. We are digesting earnings reports. And we're seeing a little bit of deterioration in sentiment as we do that. Let's have a look at some of the sectors on the move then. And we have seen retail as being quite a perhaps surprise area of strength in the last uh, couple of days or so. That continues to be the case today. Also, basic resources, uh, that sector going higher, despite other sectors bringing us a little bit lower across Europe. Into the earnings stories, and WPP, the massive advertising business listed here in London, this is an interesting one. They beat, they, they, they raised their guidance, uh, which you might have thought would send the stock higher, but not as much as peers, seems to be the conclusion from some of the analysts. And that stock down by 6.8%, a brutal assessment there. Uh, DPW, this is Deutsche Post, the owner of DHL, competitor to FedEx, of course. They've been benefiting from freight rates of the past. So even if they're talking about those freight rates normalizing, they still see in the back, in the sort of rear view mirror, a uh, 5.8% gain in their share price, reflecting that positive performance that they reported this morning. And here I've got the pound for you, Kaylee, and this is just a 
picture of keep calm and carry on. We have the central bank here in the UK now saying that inflation will go above 13%. That is their forecast, of, of course. They're also predicting now a recession, which could go just shy of two years. Even if it won't be deep, it could be long, is the assessments of the Bank of England. With all of that, we don't really see much movement in the pound. It's pretty much where it was yesterday before the Bank of England spoke. There's been volatility in the meantime, but there we are. All right, keep calm and carry on, a motto to live by, Anna. We'll see if the markets can keep calm today through a series of events that we need to watch out for, including a number of earnings reports. DraftKings is among the companies that is scheduled to give results. Then this week's heavy dose of Fed speakers will continue. We have Richmond Fed President Tom Barkin scheduled to speak at 8 a.m. Eastern time, and that is just before today's main event, the U.S. Jobs Report released at 8.30 a.m. Eastern. It's expected to show that hiring softened in July, but the labor market was still consistent with the U.S. economy in expansion, not recession. Let's get more on that now. Michael McKee, Bloomberg International Economics and Policy Correspondent, is joining us. Other than Fed Day, the Jobs Day is kind of like Mike's Super Bowl. So, Mike, what are you watching today? <laughs> well, this could be the most consequential or least consequential jobs report in a long time, and I'll tell you why. It's about the divergence that Matt was talking about between the people in the markets who think we're going to see recession and the people who think that the Fed needs to do more. The jobs numbers, 250,000 that uh, you saw on the chart there do suggest that there is a slowdown but is it because they can't find workers or is it because they're not hiring anymore and they're letting people go that's going to be a key number to look at and then unemployment here's unemployment and the jolts rate this is the big argument in economics right now we have a lot of job openings we have a very low unemployment rate to bring down the job vacancies, does unemployment have to go up significantly? That's one thing that people will be watching. No change is forecast for today. So at this point, it's a question of does the Fed end up pedal to the metal or do they have to back off? That's what people are going to be asking well, after know, the 830 number. What I've been wondering is why so many people don't believe any of the Fed speakers that have come out and aren't listening to Jerome Powell at press conferences. The Fed is clearly saying we're going to continue raising rates. Yeah, the argument is that the data are not necessarily saying you need to do that. You look at uh, just this jobs report, the establishment versus the uh, whole household surveys, two different surveys in there. The establishment has shown continued job creation, but the household numbers show that we're still losing jobs. So which one comes out on top today will have a, a sort of mental impact on people. And it's going to come down at the end of it all to uh, what the uh, famous American Yogi Bear once said, uh, and you could explain to Anna who that is. <laughs> I so think when, Kaylee might also well, be. Oh, when I you am Kaylee. Uh, well. When you come to a fork in the road, he said, take it. So today we may see a fork in the road. And you guys decide which one to take. All right. Well, we're looking forward to your coverage of that later this morning. Michael McKee, thank you so much. Of course, that full coverage of the U.S. Jobs Report will be coming uh, on Bloomberg Surveillance. Plus, we'll have an issue with Labor Secretary Marty Walsh at 930 a.m. New York time. Now let's head to Washington. Democrats have agreed on a revised version of their tax and climate bill that would impose a levy on stock buybacks. Emily Wilkins, Bloomberg government reporter, joins us now with the details from D.C. So, Emily, this is what it took to get Kirsten Sinema on board. Yes, but now Democrats do have all 50 senators they need to actually move forward with this plan. We are still waiting the exact details of exactly what was agreed to, but we know that that carried interest loophole that is going to remain. Senator Sinema wanted it to. Uh, she wanted to take uh, any sort of closure of the loophole out of that bill. We also know we're going to see some tweaks on that 15 percent minimum corporate tax. This is something that's meant to really help out manufacturers. And we're also going to see a 1 percent tax on companies stock buybacks. Now, Majority Leader Chuck Schumer said that this legislation is still going to reduce the deficit by $300 billion. It still contains various provisions on health care and on climate. Of course, one more big hurdle that Democrats have to look for here is the Senate parliamentarian. She's continuing to review the language. And remember, if she deems that something can't be passed via this reconciliation process, that's it as far as Democrats are going to be able to go. But they are expecting to move legislation uh, beginning with the vote tomorrow, and uh, they're hoping to do it before the end of the weekend. Mm, yeah, that buyback levy stays in the bill then. What does that mean for stocks? An interesting one, Emily. Let's pivot to foreign policy, though. U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken is accusing China of trying to change the status quo with a round of missile firings. Uh, Beijing conducted military exercises in the Taiwan Strait to show its unhappiness with House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's visit. 
Meanwhile, China has also announced sanctions on Nancy Pelosi and her immediate family members. Uh, this continues to develop then the tensions between China and the U.S. over the visit, even after it has passed. Yes, I mean, even though both Biden and Pelosi, when they visited, made statements saying that the U.S. does not want to change in status quo with Taiwan, uh, Beijing's response has raised a lot of concerns, as you heard from Secretary of State Anthony Blinken, saying that it now seems like China does want a change in the status quo. Uh, there are warships that have crossed the Taiwan Strait. There are the missiles, as you mentioned. There are the unspecified sanctions on Pelosi and her family, and those are mostly uh, symbolic at this point, but there's certainly a a lot of continuing tensions in that region. And Pelosi's trip, even though they were very careful with what they said, careful with what they did, it still very much inflamed tensions around the relationship between Washington and Beijing. Emily, thanks very much. Bloomberg government uh, reporter Emily Wilkins with us there from Washington. Now in corporate news, Tesla shareholders approved a three-for-one stock split as the electric vehicle maker seeks to attract an even larger number of retail investors. CEO Elon Musk spoke at the company's annual shareholder meeting yesterday. Yeah, we might be able to announce another factory location later this year. Uh, <laughs> where, where should we... Okay, where, where should we build it? Okay, we've got a lot, got a lot of Canada's. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I'm, half, I'm half Canadian, so maybe I should, you know. Elon Musk asking the audience there. Joining us now uh, for more, Bloomberg's Laura Wright. Laura, what is the significance of the stock split then, and what did we learn from the AGM? Good morning, Anna. Well, the significance is that it democratizes Tesla's share price. The market liked what it heard with Tesla reacting positively ahead of the bell. The expectation is that Tesla's share price will fall to around $300 a share from over $900 a share where it closed yesterday. That, of course, will make Tesla more affordable for its highly engaged base of retail investors. Take note, the last time a stock split took place at the electric vehicle maker was back in August of 2020. Now, during the q and Elon Musk outlined his view that inflation will subside over the coming months. You might call that a contrarian view in the current environment. And Musk projected that Tesla could produce one and a half million vehicle deliveries by the end of this year. If achieved, that follows from a record first quarter of deliveries. The elephant in the room, Twitter. Musk admitted that he genuinely wanted to help the social media platform, that he understands Twitter, but those comments come during an ugly legal battle with subpoenas and countersuits flying around. But I have to say, news that the Cybertruck is on track to be online in mid-2023 is very good news for Matt Miller, who adores the angular design of the vehicle. <laughs> uh, I'm looking forward to seeing it. In terms of the, the rally in tech, we've seen uh, um, almost double the gains of the S&P 500, almost a bull market. What are you hearing about whether or not it can be sustained? Well, there is reticence to believe in this rally. Tech is flying in the face of analyst downgrades, which you can see here in the yellow. The Nasdaq 100 almost in a bull market, up nearly 20% from its bottom in mid-June. This is because the market has aligned with the view of more dovish Fed policy in the next 12 months, shown by Fed fund futures here in the blue. So what happens now? Well, data points such as NFPs today, US CPI next week will offer an indication of where Fed policy is going and what that means for tech. All right, Bloomberg's Laura Wright, thank you so much. Now, speaking of tech, a number of other tech companies reported earnings after the bell yesterday. So let's get a check on how they're performing in pre-market trading. One of them being Lyft, of course, the ride hailer. It reported a record quarter of earnings. It really shows that the company's efforts of investment, trying to get those drivers back in the car to ease some of that shortage they are seeing, is paying off. And they have finally the supply in order to meet demand. So Lyft is up about 8.5% before the bell. It is an even bigger move, though, for another stock. We're talking a double digit move of about 12% for DoorDash. It also uh, reported a quarter that beat expectations record order volume. So essentially what that means is even though the worst of the pandemic may be over, we're still all ordering food to eat on our couch. One more uh, less positive story though is Warner Brothers Discovery. It's uh, reported earnings after the bell. It had a loss. Revenue coming up short. That stock is down about 10.5% before the bell, Anna.
Kaylee, a bit of breaking news that we should get to before we take a break. Uh, the White House is summoning the Chinese ambassador on, uh, on Taiwan and the, the response to the Taiwan story. This according to the Washington Post, saying the White House has summoned China's ambassador on Thursday to condemn Beijing's escalating actions against Taiwan and to reiterate that the U.S. does not want a crisis in the region. We've seen China, of course, sanctioning now Nancy Pelosi, as we heard earlier, and continuing to conduct those military drills around the island. We'll get back to the markets and uh, the focus of the markets really on the jobs report today. Hans Olsen, Chief Investment Officer at Fiduciary Trust Company, joins us shortly. This is Bloomberg. Happy Jobs Day. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. We are simulcast on both radio and television, and we're waiting for the all-important non-farm payrolls number. Over the last few months, we've been beating the survey. Um, uh, for those of you listening on radio, I've got a chart in front of me showing the survey right now at 250,000. But we've seen these blue bars here are the actual reports um, beats basically since the end of last year with a couple notable exceptions. Joining us now is Julia Morpurgo, Bloomberg Credit and High Yield Reporter. And Julia, what does the bond market do with this if it's a beat or a miss? Because it seems like um, bond traders are listening to the Fed speak much more closely and carefully than equities traders are. Yes, definitely. I mean, the credit markets were really the first ones to react uh, to the uh, central bank's AUKUS talk at the beginning of the year, and there's still the uh, key to watch out for when it comes to uh, how the Fed is uh, going along its uh, iconing path. Um, so today, as you said, there's the expectations that the payroll, non-term payrolls number will show 250,000 increase. Uh, if the numbers were to deviate from that consensus in either direction, we'll for sure see a big uh, reaction in credit markets, both on the uh, US side, but also on the European side. Uh, so yes, definitely all eyes off, off credit markets are onto the uh, US uh, uh, numbers today. Okay, yeah, so a big focus on that uh, payrolls number. A big, big focus here in London yesterday was, of course, on the Bank of England and what they had to say about, yes, higher inflation, their forecasts go higher and higher, and the forecasts for the economy get weaker and weaker, and yet UK assets do very little in response, Julia. Did that come as a surprise? Yes, so uh, as you said, UK assets performed uh, um, in a way that's a bit unusual when, uh, uh, for an interest rate hike, but that's because the uh, interest rate hike was uh, expected in the market, uh, although it was the, the highest we've seen in uh, 27 years. And uh, uh, we've seen the pound fall, we've seen uh, uh, credit actually hold up quite well. Um, I mean, the reason for the pound fall is that, as you say, the, the outlook is quite gloomy, really. We get Governor Bailey flagging that a recession is coming in the fourth quarter and that uh, inflation is to peak at 13.3% in October. So a real cost of living crisis is facing the country. Well, Julia, of course, as we talk about the economic data in the UK and how that is painting a gloomier picture, the Federal Reserve here in the US is looking at the labor market saying, hey, things are still really strong. Is this going to be a classic case of if the print is good, it's bad news for the market? If it's bad, that's good news? Yeah, well, if the print is good, then the Fed uh, is going to uh, seek uh, is going to feel free to go ahead with its cycling path. Whilst uh, if the numbers are not so good, then uh, the Fed might want to stop and reconsider uh, how fast it's hiking rates. And uh, yeah, taking into account what the real economy is, uh, per how the real economy is performing and what, how markets are reacting to it. Julia, thanks very much. Thanks for joining us. Bloomberg's Julia Mopurgo uh, on the markets. And you can get more detailed analysis and the thoughts of the Markets Live team. Go to MLIV Go on your Bloomberg terminal. That's where you'll find the Markets Live blog. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kaylee Lines with Matt Miller in New York and Anna Edwards in London. Now keeping you up to date with news from around the world, here's the first word. In the UK, the frontrunner to become the next prime minister says that a recession is not inevitable. Foreign Secretary Liz Truss spoke hours after the Bank of England warned that the UK is weeks from entering a recession that will last for more than a year. Truss told Sky News that the government can make it more likely the economy grows by cutting taxes. 
Another round of talks on the Iran nuclear deal are underway in Vienna. European Union diplomats tell Bloomberg that the divide between Iran and the U.S. has grown wider since the last negotiations ended. They say the remaining hurdles could be resolved within 72 hours, but that would require high-level political decisions in both Tehran and Washington. U.S. health officials have declared monkeypox a public health emergency. That's a step that will free up funding, treatments, and other services to fight the virus. The U.S. leads the world with known cases, more than 6,000 of them. And for the fourth month in a row, global food prices have dropped. A U.N. index of world food costs fell by more than 8.6 percent in July. The index is now at its lowest point since January, before Russia invaded Ukraine, a major food exporter. Still, prices remain elevated. People on low incomes are feeling the pinch as a cost of living crisis deepens. Coming up, we'll talk more about that inflationary story and what the labor report here in the U.S. will mean for the Federal Reserve. Hans Olsen, chief investment officer of fiduciary trust company, joins us next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Here's what you need to know. What the U.S. jobs report will tell us about recession. The latest unemployment numbers are out today. They may show the labor market is cooling down. China strikes back at Pelosi. It plans to impose sanctions on the House Speaker for that visit to Taiwan. Meanwhile, Democrats have agreed to a revised tax bill that would impose a levy on stock buybacks. And the world's richest person sees signs that the global economy has gone past peak inflation. Tesla CEO Elon Musk says the car maker's costs are trending downwards. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller and Kayleigh Lyons over in New York. And we're still reeling slightly from the Bank of England news of yesterday here. It seems asset prices shrugging it off, uh, Matt, but certainly a lot, of, uh, a lot of gloomy talk to digest. Was there a Bank over of in the US, Did they have though, a Bank of England decision there yesterday? Was. There was. We will mention it more later. But you're yeah. looking ahead to the jobs report, of course. Yeah, of course, because this um, applies to the most important central bank in the world, right? The Fed is watching this closely, and so are investors. It looks like there's not a lot going on. It looks like ho-hum, you know, futures are doing nothing. The dollar is doing nothing. Ten-year yield doing nothing. But there's so much kinetic energy here. It's like a spring that's compressed. <laughs> And if you get a jobs number that's big on one side or the other, you're going to see it go, oh, baby. Um, maybe you like Bitcoin. Right now, Bitcoin is up 3%. Go figure. I have no idea why. It's over $23,000, and it's typically a very correlated asset, but it's correlated um, to nothing I can see today. And if you get a good jobs print, you could see a lot of red right here. That could convince the equity market that the Fed really is going to continue raising interest rates to fight inflation and of course then we'll all be looking forward to um, the CPI and the inflation figures that are coming out next week. Yep on Wednesday really looking forward to it. Kinetic energy. Matt Miller just bringing all of the energy kinetic or not today. I'm trying to remember from physics what exactly kinetic is. I can't remember is either. either. I hope I got it right. I know that there's something else that isn't kinetic but I can't remember. Anyway let's talk about the stocks moving in free market trading because there were a lot of earnings out after the bell yesterday. Among the winners Lyft reporting a record quarter of profitability. It's up 8.5%. DoorDash had record uh, order volumes. It's up about 12%. Cloudflare, which is a software business, uh, gave a forecast that with topped expectations. It is up actually nearly 20% before the bell. And for Carvana, of course, the used car company, this is a case of just results being better than feared. So that stock is up about 8%. Not all stocks so lucky, though. You also have a number of uh, stocks moving to the downside after results. Warner Brothers Discovery reported a loss in the second quarter. The shares taking it on the chin, down about 10 10%. And for both Twilio, which is a software company, and Zillow, which is that online real estate company, they both gave forecasts that came up short of expectations. The reason why is just a softening macro environment. Of course, for the case of Zillow, it's a softening housing market. They are each down about 7%. And finally, Block, formerly Square, Jack Dorsey's company, missed expectations on payments volume. Part of that has to do with a drop in Bitcoin-related transactions. That stock dropping about 6.4% before the bell, Anna. Mm, interesting you mentioned housing. I've seen headlines from the UK to Canada, all looking a little gloomier on that front. Uh, Kaylee, not much upward energy here on European stocks, that's for sure. We've got uh, the stock 600 down by two tenths of one percent as we head. Well, we're in the second hour of trading here in the uh, third hour of trading, sorry, here in the European markets. We're still waiting for that report for later uh, on US jobs. WPP in focus from the media sector down by 6.6 percent, despite the fact they increased their guidance today, but not as much as some of their peers, not as much as therefore some in the market had anticipated. 
participated in the stock being punished as a result. Deutsche Post, the owner of DHL, that rival to FedEx, uh, the stock is up by 5.4% today. They've been benefiting, of course, from the higher freight rates that we've seen as supply chains remained, uh, remained uh, stuck to some degree and people were paying over the odds to ship things. Uh, and so that has benefited them in the past, even if they see some normalisation on that ahead. The pound, still pretty stable, really. I mean, 120, is not all that far from where we started uh, the day yesterday. And that was before we got forecasts of 13% inflation and a recession that could last for just shy of two years, Matt. All right. Uh, I just want to point out that physics major Dan Curtis, uh, <laughs> our London producer, has pointed out its potential energy that these markets have right go. now. That's the coiled spring one, right? That's the coiled <laughs> spring. Joining us is Hans Olsen, Chief Investment Officer at Fiduciary Trust. So, Hans, um, which way is this energy going to be released after the jobs report? Do you think we have a beat or a miss? 250 is the survey. Yeah, 250, 250 is a survey. It, it wouldn't surprise me to see us come in slightly above uh, what the expectations are. Um, either way, though, you know, whether it's a little below or a little above, uh, the reality is, is that the, the economy is still growing at this juncture. And um, the reality that interest rates are going to go up uh, have, to be re have to remain firmly in investors' minds. And I'm not sure they quite are. Why, why do you think the equity markets are um, so optimistic that the Fed's going to turn around and come back down? I mean, I guess the scenario involves a recession that they think scares Jay Powell and co. into um, giving us a Fed put. Is it just that they're um, used to that behavior? Yeah, I, I, it's, it's almost a bit of the return to the... Uh... The, the Goldilocks scenario, right? You remember that 20 years ago where everything will work out just fine. So if inflation will come down just enough to um, uh, ameliorate sort of the, the, the Fed's need to raise interest rates. But at the end of the day, it's really hard to see how uh, inflation comes down from what? Roughly 9% right now to something sub five quick enough in order to uh, uh, you know, prevent the Fed from having to lean into to raising interest rates even faster. Put another way, you know, even if we get to 5% on inflation, which would be remarkable, you know, in, in, in any sort of way at this juncture, does a does a 10 year yield at uh, 2.6, 2.7 make sense? Or in fact, does an entire structure of the yield curve below the inflation rate make sense on an ongoing basis? Well, let's talk about what that yield means for an equity market that, as Matt said, has definitely reflected some optimism about a Fed pivot, but also is trying to relate to what the earnings we have seen. It's been quite a rally, and you have Michael Hartnett over at Bank of America saying essentially that's when you want to fade and take profit on. I'm wondering where you fall into that. Do you think it's a time to buy or a time to sell? I I tend to think that this is a time where uh, probably in this month, uh, if there's a, an opportunity to take some profits, take them. This seems to me, uh, in short, like a uh, a counter trend rally in a bear market. Um, you know, we the, the the losses on the S and P 500 have been roughly cut in half uh, over the last 45 days. Uh, if you look at the Qs, uh, they're up almost 20 percent. You know, rallies like this inside a bear market are are pretty common. And uh, if you can, they can be traded. From our perspective, we'd be looking to take some gains in this to reset the, already the the uh, above level cash cash levels that we have in order to take advantage of the next down leg, which well, we think. And of course, Hans, the, the rally hasn't just been in equities. It's in other risky assets as well. I mean, just take a look at high yield credit spreads are, right. have narrowed substantially from the highs of earlier this month. I mean, we're only at 441 basis points on high yield. What kind of signal does that send to you? You know, Kaylee, that's an interesting point because, it, you know, it, it's, it's as if the uh, that part of the bond market is buying into the equity market narrative. Um, and, and that says to me that there's an opportunity there uh, for a reset as well. It doesn't fit that you're going to have an inverted yield curve with uh, uh, high yield spreads coming in. Uh, a, a recession in the economy cannot be good for high yield. Hans, good morning from London. I want to bring in some some uh, some thoughts from here in London and some uh, reference to the Bank of England, but really to ask whether it teaches us anything broader. Yesterday we heard from the BOE they increase interest rates 50 basis points, but at the same time predict a long, a long, quite long, but not deep recession for the UK economy. I just want to play you a little bit of what we heard from Hugh Pill, the chief economist at the Bank of England. 
we were not expecting uh, a repeat of experiences of the past, of my childhood, where interest rates were going sky high. Uh, we think that the, the, sort of the equilibrium level of interest rate, if you like, that's a very vague concept, are difficult to estimate, but we think it's much lower now than it was in yeah. previous episodes. If we get inflation back to target of 2%, the nominal interest rates will return to levels, broadly speaking, in that kind of range as well. And I want to bring the Bank of England into this conversation about the US hands to ask if there are any lessons at all, because this is a central bank hiking into a weakening economy with a tight labour market, which rings a few, uh, a few uh, alarm bells about similarities. Right, right. I think there was something else that uh, uh, Mr. Pill said in that interview that I thought was really interesting. He said right after that, he said, you know, essentially their end point will be what normal looks like for the Bank of England is uh, uh, an interest rate that is slightly above the inflation rate, right? So you have a real rate of interest that reflects real growth in the economy. Um, that I thought was really revealing, refreshing, refreshingly uh, straightforward. Uh, and we don't get a lot of that in the uh, the American mm. uh, from the American Fed, so I really like the messaging because it's very clear, it's consistent, uh, and you don't have a lot of uh, people running around at the Bank of England saying different things where we tend to have with the the American Fed. So um, I, I think that's very uh, that was a although a difficult message, a very clear message, and that probably would be welcomed in the American market, judged judging from what we see in the differences between the bond market and the equity market. Yeah. Do you, do you want central bankers to be so candid hands? I mean, clearly you want them to be honest and give their best faith assessments. But at the same time, it's, it's pretty it makes for pretty tough listening. Yeah. You know, I, I would I like this, this sort of the, the notion of saying less and meaning more. Right. Um, that that could be very helpful to investors. OK, Hans, thanks so much. Thanks for joining us. Hans Olsen, Fiduciary Trust's CIO. Thanks for spending time with us here on Bloomberg Surveillance, the early edition. Coming up, China continues those military drills around Taiwan. More on China's response to Speaker Nancy Pelosi's Taiwan visit. That's next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. You're looking live at the Principal Room. Coming up later today, Mohammed El Arian, a Bloomberg Opinion columnist. That interview at 9 a.m. New York time, 2 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. China has chosen to overreact and use Speaker Pelosi's visit as a pretext to increase provocative military activity in and around the Taiwan Strait. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken speaking earlier at a news conference in Cambodia. That, of course, as Chinese warships have crossed the Taiwan Strait during dividing line today. It's an unusual move signaling that those large-scale military maneuvers around Taiwan are continuing. China also has announced sanctions on U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi after her visit there, which of course is what has sparked this escalation in events. Rosalind Matheson, Bloomberg Senior Executive Editor for Government, joins us now for more. Ros, let's first start with those sanctions on the House Speaker. How significant are they? Well, it is the most significant uh, sanctions move against a U.S. official in terms of seniority to date. We've seen a lot of sanctions flying both, uh, back and forth with officials from the U.S. and China uh, in recent years. But what it tangibly does is not very much unless Nancy Pelosi and her family perhaps were planning a summer holiday in China sometime soon. You imagine this will restrict her and her family from traveling there, but financial impact will be will be nothing. Uh, the main thing is, again, China is just trying to show their displeasure at her specifically, saying you made a choice to go to Taiwan this week and you've caused all these tensions that have spiraled in recent days, as you were noting, with all the military drills that are now underway. But certainly it's sending a, a message to her, but unlikely to affect her directly and her family as a result. Mm. Rosalind, good morning. We're also seeing reports that the US is summoning the Chinese ambassador to express displeasure and to try to make the point that they don't want to change the sort of status quo in the region. How are we seeing a big ramp up in tensions between these two countries, do we think, or do we think that this will die down? 
Well, certainly, I think I've lost count of the number of ambassadors who've been summoned in the past couple of days between the US, China, uh, Japan and elsewhere over all of this. And that's a bit of a usual thing that, that countries tend to do in these moments. What's worth watching really particularly is the level to which China is responding militarily and how far to the line they're going with these drills that they're carrying out. Of course, we're seeing now that some of those missiles yesterday seem to have flown over Taiwan itself for the first time ever. And as you were just noting, China warships going up through the midline for the first time in a while. And so you're seeing a lot of extensive military pressure occurring on Taiwan and by de facto, of course, onto the US as a result. The question is, how far mm. does that go? China's due to wrap up its drills in a couple of days. It might say, look, we've sent you a message. We've done all that in four days and now let's all settle down again. But certainly at least okay. from the domestic perspective, China had to do something. Yes, and just as we're speaking, Rosalind, we're just getting a few headlines coming through, which I'll bring to the audience's attention. China is saying it will halt climate change talks with the United States. It will cancel military dialogue with the United States and also cancel a work meeting with the U.S. Defence Ministry. So in answer to my question, I suppose, Rosalind, we haven't seen the worst of this. This continues to escalate. Well, that's right. And that's one of the key fallout things we also want to watch is like because the US and China might have tensions over trade and technology and a bunch of different things, but they also are the two biggest economies on the planet. And in many ways, there are things they need to cooperate on mm. that are global challenges, energy prices, climate change and so on. And if you have them, the, the China now saying they're going to withdraw from some of those dialogues and conversations, then you could see a broader effect, obviously, from the events of this week. You know, I, I wonder what the effect has been on directly on businesses. When we saw Russia um, invade Ukraine, obviously a lot of businesses rushed, um, some faster than others, to pull their businesses out of Russia. And there was a lot of talk about China. Will that same thing happen if they um, invade Taiwan? In fact, we've seen Stellantis actually pull um, business, uh, close, close a factory in China and say that they don't want to be the victim of cross sanctions, as has been the case for companies in other regions, clearly making the parallel. Do you see any other cases, Roz, of businesses saying, like, you know, this is too hot for us, we're out? Not at this stage. I mean, interestingly, what you probably saw is, com is companies over the longer term saying, ideally, they want to diversify their supply chains. That was a process that probably started under the former administration. Of course, Donald Trump was the one who kicked off a trade war with China. And you saw many companies then realizing they probably needed to think about diversity in their supply chain in the long run and perhaps relocating their operations to other parts of Asia. So that's been an ongoing process already for quite a few years. And you may not see an immediate reaction. Of course, the hope from many companies, no doubt, is that this does die down again in a matter of weeks. You see yeah. these gestures from China, but how, how far will it go? Because in the end, uh, China, Taiwan, the US, Japan, none of these countries actually want a war. Meanwhile, Roz, we're continuing to get headlines on those countermeasures China is imposing against the U.S. There are now eight in total after Pelosi's trip to Taiwan. The two uh, latest headlines crossing is China halting cooperation with the U.S. on crime fighting and canceling maritime military mechanism meetings with the U.S. So we have an understanding now of what those countermeasures are. Matt was just bringing up the case of Russia and the war in Ukraine. Uh, and what we have seen in that is that it is not the U.S. alone in retaliation, retaliating against Russia. It has been a coalition of allies that has proved quite strong. For the issue of China, though, can the U.S. count on the backing of its allies to the same extent? Is there a sense that the, the columns are not so clearly divided in this case? Well, certainly we saw the group of seven nations issue a statement of concern. You saw the EU issue uh, statements of concern. But you also see a bit of anxiety because, of course, it's one thing for, for Russia to invade Ukraine. That's unlikely to draw in the rest of the world mil militarily to the same extent as if China were to invade Taiwan. Uh, that probably would draw on the U.S. militarily in terms of troops on the ground. Uh, and so you see, you see a sense of anxiety amongst some Asian nations in Southeast Asia and elsewhere, just like, hang on, we would actually prefer that this really cools down. Uh, and so you're seeing those statements being quite measured. And certainly probably some of the conversations going on is how can we all just walk this back? How can we diffuse this situation? Uh, and you see that in the US language as well uh, from some of the officials uh, and from Japan and, and, and other countries is that everyone wants to walk this up and everyone has a point to make. And suddenly the US has a point to make here, but no one really wants mm. to see this tip over into an outright conflict.
Well, Rosalind, thank you so much for your time. Uh, very very well-timed analysis for us as those headlines just crossed the Bloomberg terminal. Bloomberg's Rosalind Matheson with analysis of the relationship between the US and China right now. Now, while the Biden administration continues to weigh tensions with China, the US jobs report will take center stage in a few hours' time. Stay with Bloomberg for full coverage, of course, and plenty of analysis, plus an interview with the Labor Secretary, Marty Walsh. That's at 9.30 a.m. New York time. This is Bloomberg. We've had a very big, very big shock. Now is the time to be bold. Fall in real incomes, another significant deterioration in the outlook for activity in the UK. It is, of course, extremely worrying. GDP growth in the UK has slowed and the economy is now forecast to enter recession later this year. But it is not inevitable. We can change the outcome and we can make it more likely that the economy grows. We in the Conservative Party need to get real and fast. CPI inflation is now expected to peak at just over 13%. And the lights on the economy are flashing red, and the root cause is inflation. UK officials speaking there after the Bank of England announced its decision yesterday to hike rates by the most since 1995, painting a dire picture whilst it was doing that for the, uh, for the UK economy. Now, July's US jobs report brings the latest chance to gauge the strength or weakness of the US economy. Tom Keane will help lead the coverage of today's report, of <coughs> course, and he joins us now. Tom, take us to your thinking and your single best chart. It's going to be interesting. as I eight ways to go here. Let's go to the chart of the year. This is going to be... I, 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 I can't believe I got a different chart of the year. I'm not willing to call it right now, but this is uh, pretty close. This is what everyone's talking about, which is the percent of Americans employed. As yes. you know, uh, uh, Anna, that, that it's about a fully employed America. Back to the dismal 70s where the line slopes down. And up, up we go to the ginormous boom mostly led by women employed through the 1980s up to the miracle of 1999. And yeah, then a crisis and then a pandemic, and we barely made it back. Yeah, it's a fantastic chart, especially on a day like today, Tom. When it comes to this employment report, who are you going to talk to about it on today's show? We're going to lead strong with Dominic Constant for Global Wall Street. This is absolutely must. I'm going to cut to the chase. Constant thinks the worry warts are wrong, wrong, wrong. This is a Fed in control. All right, Tom Keen, looking forward to the coverage from you, John, and Lisa over the next three hours. Thank you so much. And I am looking forward, Matt, to just seeing how this market reacts to the jobs report. I would assume that if we get a strong print, it's going to be a pretty negative reaction for risk assets. Yeah, I think uh, it'll be very interesting, a little bit of a reality check for sure if there's a strong print. I also want to point out that, you know, Tom's chart of the year, I saw that earlier. Dan Curtis sent it around in a chart note that were issued before um, the show. And I think it's really fascinating that we are almost back. I think just about 500,000 jobs away from pre-pandemic levels. So the great resignation has in some senses been washed away and there's still almost two job openings for every unemployed person out there. Yeah, exactly. The, uh, the extent of the tightness in the U.S. labor market is still a real preoccupation then for these markets. We will shed new light on that today with that jobs report due out uh, in, in the next hours. And plenty of coverage, of course, coming on the next program, Surveillance. That lies ahead with Tom and John and Lisa. They will bring you uh, all of the latest news flow surrounding the U.S. labor market and the market response, the market reaction to that data. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.